Hi, uh, we're now speaking to Dr. Forkingham about his recent paper on uh, lungfish trackways. Um, could you give me a summary of your work? Yeah, so my interest is locomotion in the fossil record. I'm interested in how animals move and how that locomotion evolves through time. Um, and as with anything where you're interested in long uh, evolutionary processes, the best way of looking, that, looking at that is in fossils. Uh, so I'm, most of my work actually surrounds dinosaur footprints, uh, but I branch out into other types of footprints. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, my most recent paper is on lungfish trackways, which of course don't have feet, so they're <laughs> not really footprints as such. Um, and so in this paper, my colleague Angela Horner and I put a lungfish on some mud, we let it flap around and we let it make trackways to see what it looked like. Um, which sounds very simplistic. Uh, there's a bit more to it than that, obviously. Uh, my colleague had worked on EMGs and how the muscles activate in lungfish. And, uh, when we were chatting about various uh, trackways and things, she, she said to me, I bet these things leave really weird trackways when you let them move on a deformable substrate like mud or sand. So we got a lungfish and we tried to figure out what it does, what kind of tracks it leaves behind. Um, and what was really interesting is the way these things move, they kind of plant the head into the substrate and then flick the body, and then plant the head the other side and flick the body. And what happens is the body doesn't leave much of an impression generally. The pressure isn't high enough, so obviously the weight of the animal is there, but there's a big surface area. Whereas the mouth has this very small surface area that it's pushing into the substrate. And so you get these impressions alternating left and right. And sometimes when the lungfish has its mouth open, it leaves paired impressions from the upper and lower jaws, uh, mouth parts. And the interesting thing here is that that looks kind of like you would expect a tetrapod trackway. So a trackway left by an animal with four limbs. Uh, the paired impressions are almost like manus and pears, forefoot and hindfoot, almost. We thought there were some similarities there, and so we documented the trackways using photogrammetry. We digitized these things so that we could uh, height map them and view them really clearly. Uh, and then we drew some similarities with previously described trackways from tetrapods and from eurypterids, so sea, ancient sea scorpions, and various other trackways. And, and the point was, this is a fish making trackways that look kind of like they were left by an animal with four legs. And it's so important to look at what extant animals do uh, in order to interpret fossils that you find uh, in the rocks. So how commonly do you think that these trackways are being misinterpreted then in the fossil record? It might not be a case that many have been misinterpreted so far, if any. It might actually be more likely that people have come across these strange marks and thought, don't know what that is. The problem is you can find something really interesting, but if you have no interpretation or anything to do with it, you're not going to write a paper about it. And so the literature isn't going to record that. And so they may have been found and simply discarded, thrown away, or misinterpreted as being made by either inanimate objects hitting the mud or by other animals moving around. And yes, we proposed maybe there's a possibility that some tetrapod tracks might not be made by tetrapods. Uh, there are certainly none that are particularly prominent in the literature, we would think. We wouldn't think any of those are necessarily oh, lumpish. It's more of those like, missing, yeah, missing exactly. cases because people haven't been recording them. Exactly. So, in fact, we actually have lungfish burrows throughout the fossil record and no lungfish trackways have ever been reported. So it may just be a case that nobody knew what to look for. And how important is the different substrate? So it, does mud give a different result to sand? Yeah, so, I mean, this, this is the case for anything. If you go walking along a beach... Uh, dry sand, moist sand, mud, you'll leave different footprints behind. And the same is true for the lungfish. Uh, what we found was that the, the mud that we used, the head would bury in really nicely and leave these very clean impressions, and the body wouldn't do much at all. As I said, it, 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 the pressure is low, uh, and so it doesn't really indent the mud much. But the mud is very cohesive, so it doesn't, doesn't deform it at all. Whereas the sand, sand uh, shears really easily, so at the surface Lots of the sand was moved left and right, and so it was left. It left a very different mm. impression. With the mud, wow! Um, uh, so you're using extant creatures here. Um, how, like, how beneficial do you think that will be in the future? Do you think you'll be using more living creatures to understand creatures that are no longer alive? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, something that uh, 
through my postdoc and fellowship mainly, I definitely learned that you can't really study extinct animals until you've studied living animals. Um, there's no point speculating on what an extinct animal did if you don't know how living animals move. Uh, my collaborator at Brown University, Stephen Gates, who I went to work with on my, on my fellowship, he actually put it nicely. My fellowship was, I want to see how dinosaurs move differently to birds. And his answer was, oh yeah, how do birds move? <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out that's a whole complex area yeah. with dozens of researchers figuring out how different birds move and the intricacies of it. And so trying to argue how this whole clade of dinosaurs that lasted 100 million years moves compared to birds which have been around for 100 million years is... It's a, not, it's a nothing question. It's, yeah, it's you too can't complex. do one without the other at all. Right. So my research is very much on, on living animals now. I have a lot of work with modern birds and figuring out the substrate foot interactions. And that means taking, almost taking the biology out and taking it to a mechanistic approach. As the foot goes in, how does the mud deform around it? How does it leave certain features? And then we can start looking at dinosaur footprints and saying, OK, can we see the same features? If not, why not? And if so, does that mean there are similarities? Maybe that's a way to look at it, is look for the similarities rather than the differences. That's fascinating. Um, you mentioned photogrammetry. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what that technology is and other technologies that are being used in these kind of research? Yeah, so certainly in ichnology, the study of fossil traces, uh, laser scanning and more recently photogrammetry have totally changed this. So laser scanning is where you scan an object with a laser and you get a 3D model. Photogrammetry is where you just use the camera on your phone or a normal digital camera, you take a load of photos and then through software magic or trigonometry, it calculates the positions of the cameras and is able to reconstruct the 3D surface. So we can essentially capture what we could capture with a laser scanner but just with the phone in your pocket, uh, which is completely and utterly transformed the way we can collect data. Um, you know, we, we can now go out into the field, collect a load of photos, build a model, email it to someone at the other side of the world, and you can collaborate much more easily. Uh, whereas in the past, you would find a fossil and you would draw a 2D outline around it, and you would lose all that information. Is it a lot cheaper, I'm guessing, as well, than playing with laser scanners? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So if, um, when I was doing my PhD 10 years ago, um, a laser scanner would cost tens of thousands and... The one we had was a really big, bulky thing. It looked like a nuclear weapon, so going through customs <laughs> with it was always a nightmare. What is this? Um, and now photogrammetry, the software is freely available. There's loads of different uh, open source and commercial packages out there. Uh, just five or six years ago, you needed a really beefy workstation. Now it'll run on a laptop or it'll run in the cloud, which is really cool because you don't even need the power there in your own computer. Um, and so it really is just totally accessible to everyone. And it's, I hesitate to say it's foolproof. It's more or less foolproof. There are things that can catch people out. But once you get the hang of it, it's a relatively straightforward method that literally just requires taking photos and mm -hmm. running a piece of software on it. And do that with a camera that you can get access to very easily. Exactly, yeah. That's, that's great. Yeah, yeah. it's brilliant. Um, bit of a fun question. If you could go back in time and see an extinct animal or creature, what would it be? Yeah. <laughs> and just observe it. Well, I don't want to be to be too generic, but going back and seeing something like a Tyrannosaurus would be amazing. Yeah. Not just because it's big and scary and has giant teeth, but it's an eight-ton biped. It walks on two legs. We have nothing yeah. even like that today, and we, we think these things weighed upwards of six, seven, eight, nine tons. How did it move? How did it stand? What did it do? Uh, the same goes for things like Quetzalcoatlus, the giant pterosaur with a wingspan as big as a glider. Were these things flying actively or swooping? I don't know. There's all these animals that are so different to what we have today, it would be fascinating to see yeah. how they moved. Oh, that's great. I think I'd want to see a mammoth like mammoths. <laughs> <laughs> they have amazing teeth. Uh, thank you so much for joining You're us. You're welcome. Um, we'll put a link to the paper. Um, you've got a website, I understand, as well. I do. And a Twitter account. Indeed. Um, we'll put a link to all of those. Um, really recommend you have a read and um, follow Peter on Twitter. Thank you again. All right. Thank you. Bye.